Hello and welcome to another edition of Think Kent Discovers. It's been a while and we're very excited to share with you our latest batch of films, including today's launch of The Sport of Breathing. The documentary showcases the research of Professor John Dickinson from the University of Kent, who's investigated respiratory issues like asthma and dysfunctional breathing in athletes in order to improve their health and performance. Professor Dickinson's work has meant countless athletes have been able to reach their full potential. We'll be speaking with Professor Dickinson shortly, along with Dr. Julie Stang from the Norwegian School of Sports Sciences and NHS consultant Professor Mike Loosemore, MBE, who's been England and Team GB's Chief Medical Officer. They're going to be discussing the film in a few moments' time, as well as answering questions from you at home. And if you have anything you'd like to put to the panel, you can send in your questions and comments in the live chat sidebars on whichever stream you're watching on. Now, that's enough from me. We'll be back shortly. But first, here's a sport of breathing. <laughs> Athletes are in peak physical condition and their commitment to their craft is unparalleled. The field of sport is so competitive they would do anything to beat the best, win medals and etch their name in sporting history. For many though, there's something missing, stopping them from being at the height of their potential and that is that they don't know how to breathe. Now of course they can breathe but there are techniques, patterns, and in some cases, undiagnosed asthma that they have yet to learn about. This is one subject Professor John Dickinson is researching. He works in the field of sports science at the University of Kent and has helped to develop methods to enhance the performance for each of the athletes that he's worked with. Some of our work has demonstrated that over 20% of elite athletes have the condition and that actually increases up to almost 70% in certain populations like swimmers. Put that in comparison to the UK population, where 9% of the UK population have an asthmatic condition. And that sort of puts in context that a lot of athletes are more likely to experience respiratory problems than non-athletes. What we're hoping to do with this research is really change the way that athletes' respiratory health is managed. 20, 30 years ago, it was still wasn't really very well managed at all. And still, even now, athletes aren't really getting the best service of care possible. Although, although we now know what the best service of care may look like which has still not um, got a, a gold standard test for. So we can start to use our research to help inform the next wave of improvements in respiratory care, not just in the UK, but around the world. He is trained with the very best, including the England football team, elite tennis players preparing for the US Open, rugby players, boxers, track athletes, cyclists, and even extreme sports people. He has shared what he knows to the English Institute of Sport and to doctors and physios of sporting stars. One of these up-and-coming athletes is Georgia Coates, member of the GB swimming team. His help has not only spurred her on towards the Olympics, but it's uncovered something she didn't even know was there. So it's quite intense. Um, I train ten times a week, normally two times a day, um, two and a half hour swim sessions and then also three gym sessions as well. I was almost confused about what was going on. I was struggling with breathing a lot in hard sets and even just low level training as well and I got on an inhaler which helped a little bit but there were still some difficulties that I found. Seeing the doctor and things like that they realised it might be dysfunctional breathing. My pattern was completely wrong but using the power breathing, the K5, from filming in the pool I've seen the difference but also a change in you know I'm racing a lot better. It's not the limiting factor now and I, it definitely was before. All the help and feedback that I've got from John Dickerson I'll definitely use for the rest of my career. A crucial element to any sporting team is their physio. John has been funneling his knowledge onto these practitioners to further widen the amount of people who know how to deal with respiratory problems. After diagnosing one athlete and putting them on a breathing pattern retraining plan, their success story led to an Olympic medal. An athlete who had quite significant breathing dysfunction leading up to the Rio Olympic Games 
Um, they weren't able to train normally because of this um, and certainly weren't able to perform in competition to their full, full ability. Both important to have people on the ground informed, such as myself, who are working with them day to day, but they really valued the opinion of an expert such as John. And ultimately, the athlete did go on to successfully win an Olympic medal at the Games. So really, that's the, the proof is in the pudding where, in terms of performance. Having a respiratory problem can be distressing for athletes, so getting their diagnosis can calm their anxiety. Training more people to help the athlete work through a condition will help the sport exponentially and already has for Team GB swimmers. Often if somebody does have a problem with their breathing pattern, it would be the physios who would probably be expected to or left to help manage that. Whereas I hear a lot around the network of different sports that actually people aren't fully comfortable necessarily and it's not something that a lot of physios are trained in. A significant bulk of the basis of our strategy is based on what John has both taught us in terms of his interactions with individual athletes and through our athlete health screening. And alongside um, another physiotherapist in the EIS, have been developing some interactive educational uh, tools for basically which is going to be shared with EIS physiotherapists and athlete health practitioners across all sports. After testing large groups of athletes to see if they've developed exercise induced asthma, most elites have developed mild to moderate cases, some even having severe cases and they didn't know it. However, some are more at risk. Compare swimming to say boxing. Swimmers are more susceptible to respiratory conditions and the prevalence of asthma is 70%. Boxers are exposed to high breathing rates, but this isn't necessarily for a long period of time and they have a ventilated room to train in. For swimmers, they spend what could be five hours a day, six days a week in the pool. This environment can also have a high chloramine concentration, which can cause an inflammatory process, which might cause an athlete to develop an asthma condition over a long period of time. Very different to recreational swimming, of course, and Dr. Guy Evans has been working with John on the world-class program for three years, hoping to improve athletes' respiratory health. My primary goal is to make sure that we have fit and healthy athletes, and if we have fit and healthy athletes, they, they will generally perform well. And approximately half of our swimmers would require inhaler therapy for asthma. Often a swimmer will come on to the world-class programme having seen their GP, maybe being told that they have asthma, they've tried a few inhalers, and really never got to the bottom of their symptoms. Similarly, we have some who come on programme who've been told that they have asthma, and actually when we do the testing, we realise that it's not in fact asthma, it's one of the other two disorders. One of these is ILO, exercise-induced laryngeal obstruction. This requires a different treatment focusing on breathing patterns instead of medication, and before this, an athlete would have suffered with an undiagnosed respiratory condition, so spotting this potential misdiagnosis is imperative to their performance and well-being, as it's the number one reason why they would miss training. Now, when you think about injury, often in a pool environment, we can get our athletes doing other things in the water. If they've hurt their ankle, they can use a pool boy and they can swim with their upper body. If they've hurt their shoulder, they can do a kick session. If an athlete is ill, or they've got a flare of asthma, they can't train. So actually they, they tend to miss bigger chunks through illness rather than injury. Minimizing this is really important to us. We know when we look back through our own data that athletes who adhere to approximately 90% or more of their training in a year are likely to be the most successful athletes on our program. So it's clear that the research into these respiratory issues in athletes is making a difference and there's potential to go further we spoke to the British swimming team before the global coronavirus pandemic, so for them and many others in sport, their dreams were put on hold. COVID-19 is a virus that affects your lungs and airways, so it has become more important than ever to continue testing. We've managed to find ways to support athletes remotely, so I've done a lot of video consultations with athletes. And what we found is that some athletes who did contract COVID have actually got symptoms that are related to sort of long COVID and are still struggling to recover. We're working with them to try and understand how that's affecting their respiratory system. But we're also interested about the way they change their breathing patterns as well. It's fair to say that the sporting world was turned upside down throughout the coronavirus pandemic, with many sporting events in 2020 being canceled, namely the Tokyo Olympics, the London Marathon, and big tennis tournaments like Wimbledon. The Lawn Tennis Association houses elite players 
who luckily were allowed to continue training early in the first lockdown. One LTA athlete we caught up with was Harriet Dart. Throughout the pandemic, the tennis star used all the advice John gave her and she looked forward to the big things that were coming up next. We did a range of different exercises and I continue to practice these each day. I'm continuously looking out for my respiratory health and this has helped me a lot with my tennis career and in general life. When my breathing is better, my shoulder positioning is in, in a lot better place and I can focus more on my game. I have hopes for good chances in the Grand Slams and with the help of all these exercises for my breathing, I really think that I can eliminate a lot of my injuries in the upper limb. It doesn't seem like there's much room for improvement for elite athletes, but actually in many cases, using the way you breathe to your advantage can be the difference between winning or losing. A lot of these athletes have had a lifetime of breathing a certain way, but also have already reached pretty impressive goals. And therefore, trying to retrain is, a, is, is quite a challenge. And so with quite a few of our athletes that have been given exercises through John, we try and obviously incorporate them in their day-to-day -day rehabilitation, but also we try and incorporate them when they're actually performing on the elite platform. And so some of our athletes have utilised the exercises for kind of helping with performance, helping physiologically, but also psychologically. John's even collaborated with researchers in Norway who have changed their practices based on data produced here at the University of Kent. John's research has also informed the treatment of asthma in competition, having worked with the anti-doping agency to change policy. Something like your typical blue inhaler, if used out of line with the rules above therapeutic levels, it can give some an advantage. The anti-doping research has enabled John to educate athletes about the appropriate use of asthma therapy to protect lung health within the rules. We've demonstrated that if athletes are dehydrated and they take doses within the water limit, their actual level of the drug in the urine can go above the decision thresholds that water use. So effectively what we're doing is we're ensuring that athletes are able to have as good a respiratory health as possible and also compete on a level playing field with their non-asthmatic counterparts. There's still plenty to do to improve the quality of care in respiratory health in athletes, something that's often overlooked. But with this research, athletes will have the potential to reach the peak of their sport without limits all across the world. So there we are, the sport of breathing. And I'm delighted to say Professor John Dickinson joins us on the line now, along with Dr. Julie Stang from the Norwegian School of Sports Sciences and NHS consultant and GB and Team England Medi Chief Medical Officer, Professor Mike Lusmore, MBE. Remember, if you have any questions for our panel, please do send them in via Facebook and YouTube on the live chat sidebars. Professor Dickinson, we're going to come to you first. Uh, let's begin at the very beginning. How and uh, why did you first pursue this area of research? Uh, well, I first got into uh, doing this uh, kind of research uh, back in 2003. An opportunity came up to, to start a PhD um, working directly with the Olympic, um, uh, or with the British Olympic Association. Um, and back then, um, athletes, um, it was the first Olympic Games building up to the Athens uh, 2004 Olympic Games where athletes uh, had to prove they had an, as an asthma condition to be able to use uh, the blue inhaler, so inhaled salbutamol at the Olympic Games. And so the opportunity arose there. And, and from then, we just, we, we, we kind of, um, we, we make, you know, we, there was very limited testing available for athletes back then. So we started to uncover quite a lot of things that we may, maybe weren't expecting. And so the, the main, the, some of those things were that athletes were more likely to have an asthmatic condition than, than non-athletes. Um, we found a lot of athletes maybe have been given an inhaler when they didn't necessarily need it. And we also found a lot, um, we start to uncover conditions that, that we now refer to as uh, disordered breathing patterns or exercise induced laryngeal obstruction, which really weren't particularly well managed back then. And since then, kind of our, our research has kind of gone and try, tried to better understand those, those things uh, to, to better support the athletes. 
It's amazing hearing about those uh, those changes that have happened um, in the space of, of 20 years since Athens um, 2004. Um, how have you seen the research generally and, and perhaps the conversation around respiratory health in sport? How have you seen that change over the course of the last um, 20, or 20 or so years? Um, well, I think um, probably back when I when I first started doing doing the work, I, I, I was I think I was probably one, one of maybe one or two other people in the whole of the UK um, doing work around kind of breathing issues in athletes. Since then, um, there's certainly many more uh, researchers that are taking on taking on the, the the mantle of investigating this work. I think it's become a lot more recognised within sports medicine that athletes, you know, just just because you're breathless during exercise. The default maybe 20 or 30 years ago was to kind of hand out an inhaler and, um, and you know, and just sort of and, and see, see how it's managed. Whereas now I think the, the message is out there that, um, you know, we need to look at the whole respiratory system. We need to look at the upper airway and the lower airway. We need to understand what when an athlete is experiencing respiratory symptoms. And then we can start to support the athlete in, in a much um, more efficient manner and, and actually provide them with, with optimum care. So it should mean that once we've actually worked with them now, we, we better understand the condition. So therefore, um, athletes can kind of compete symptom free uh, the majority of the time. And that message as well spread far beyond the shores of the UK as well. Um, Dr. Stung, it was mentioned uh, in the film that you've been working with uh, Professor uh, Dickinson in uh, Norway. How did that uh, relationship come about and how has the work he's done informed uh, that work taking place in Norway? Uh, actually, I don't think it was referred to me working with uh, with Dr. Dickinson. I think that's the, a group from Haukeland in Bergen, led by Hege Klem, among others. Uh, I, I know John from um, when I finished my PhD uh, in 2018, and he was my opponent. And, and since then, we have uh, had the uh, yes, meeting uh, sometimes, not the last years, but uh, having a good uh, collegial communication regarding research and um, questions that I hope that we could uh, continue collaborating more in the future. Absolutely, and that's one of the uh, the key messages we've we've got from a lot of these uh, documentaries is those collaborations uh, and a lot of times international collaborations as well, um, leading to uh, to change in this case in in athletes' health. Um, now, interestingly, uh, we were looking mainly at uh, summer sports in that um, uh, in that film. Um, Dr. Stang, obviously very different um, sports that, that Norway excels at, uh, often at the Winter Games as well. Do we see differences in respiratory health of different athletes from different regions in the world? And, and indeed, how does those environments impact on um, respiratory health? Uh, absolutely. We see that the environment uh, is, is very important regarding the both the prevalence of sim symptoms and also respiratory disorders in athletes. So obviously, as mentioned, swimmers uh, are, are highly affected, but also winter sport when they breathe in cold and dry air. Uh, in, in my experience, the, the winter sport endurance athletes have a lot of symptoms, but actually they are not as uh, affected or they don't have as high prevalence for asthma as the swimmers do, actually. Yeah, it's really interesting looking at all those different relationships and talking of winter sports, um, now's obviously a good time to bring in uh, Professor Lou Smore. Uh, I know you've obviously worked a lot with uh, with winter athletes. Tell us a little bit about um, your role and how Professor Dickinson's work has informed your um, duties uh, for the NHS for var and for various GB uh, and England sides. It's okay. <laughs> a big question. Um, I, well, I've worked with John uh, since he started his PhD at the Olympic Medical Institute uh, in the early 2000s. And I've seen the work evolve from being puzzled why people who appeared to have asthma didn't respond to asthma treatment. And also, at the time, the surprising fact that so many elite sportsmen who were supposed to be fit and well, whether they were winter sportsmen or summer sportsmen, appeared to have asthma. So there was this combination of people not responding to asthma treatment, plus the large number of athletes that did have asthma that we weren't diagnosing. 
Yeah. And what's been the reaction that you found from the athletes that you've worked with who've incorporated Professor Dickinson's work and into their routines and some of those, uh, you know, those pioneering changes that have taken place over the last couple of decades? Well, I think a lot of athletes were surprised that they had asthma, that they, they, they weren't aware of it. They were performing at a, a reasonable level. They, they were on Olympic teams. And so to have a diagnosis of asthma was a strange thing for them at the time. Uh, of course, when you can treat their asthma and, Im and improve their performance, they're, they're always delighted. Yeah, absolutely. And as we um, heard one of those case studies in the film um, going on to um, to podium places, as I mentioned uh, a couple of times uh, already, if you've got any questions for our panel, you can send them in uh, via the live chat sidebars on YouTube and Facebook. We've had one question already. Uh, I'm going to hand this one over to um, Professor uh, Luce Moore, um, as we were obviously just talking about that uh, with athletes training and, and asthma. Um, a question from Diane Fox, who said, at what age can athletes start uh, breathing retraining. Um, her son, who's 10, has been uh, just been prescribed an inhaler uh, as he was getting breathless during swimming training. So, um, so Professor Luce Moore, at what age can athletes start breathing retraining? Well, I think this is probably more a question for John because John has the most experience in, in retraining athletes for breathing. But I, I suspect at any age it, you can start to do the breathing retraining. The most important thing I think, and I think John would agree with this, is that the, you get the correct diagnosis because you, if you have disordered breathing, then breathing retraining will help considerably. If you have asthma, then having the right asthma treatment will help considerably. So the most important thing initially is to get the correct diagnosis. Professor Dickinson, over to you for, for that as well. Uh, uh, Professor Lucemore setting you up. For, just to answer Diane's question, what age can athletes start breathing retraining? Yeah, I mean, I, I t totally agree with uh, with Mike's comment there. It, it, initially, it's about getting the correct diagnosis because, um, as, as Mike said, that you know, if, if we're treating, if we're helping, working on breathing pattern, and it's actually maybe asthma is the main the main problem, then um, inhalers or well, getting the right therapy is appropriate. But in terms of actually what age, um, I mean, I, I've worked with with with, with um, kind of children at around about the age of ten or so. Um, and, and upwards, um, at, but kind of at any age, really. Um, I think the main thing is that obviously with, with children, it, sometimes it's a little bit harder for them to understand kind of some some of the instructions that we're asking them to do in terms of the way they're breathing. But probably from the age of ten, uh, the, it, uh, the the work we've done with, with children at that age um, has been been effective. Um, and usually at that age, that they're, they're quite receptive to changing their breathing pattern. It's much easier to change a breathing pattern of a of, of, a, of a child because they've had less less years um, of breathing kind of inappropriately. Whereas working with a with an athlete who's kind of mid thirties, who's been breathing it, uh, kind of in a, in a certain way for the last 25 years is sometimes a bit of a challenge challenge to kind of get them to, to change their breathing pattern. Yeah, absolutely. Diane, thank you very much for sending your question in and uh, all our viewers uh, do keep them uh, coming in. Um, Professor Dickinson, we're going to stick with um, you because we touched on this um, uh, a few times before um, uh, before today's event um, uh, about the kind of, I guess, maybe the, the taboos around um, uh, around breathing and, and respiratory issues in athletes. Um, have you found athletes with respiratory issues that's a more prevalent case now or is it that maybe the science and the the welfare available um are making more cases um come to light that that maybe wouldn't have happened um or wouldn't have come to come to light prior to this research yeah i think it's, it's an interesting question and i think you know we, we are seeing probably higher rates of uh, respiratory issues being detected now than than previously but i think majority of that is likely to be because our our methods of of detection are, have improved and also the availability and the scope of testing that, that we provide has increased so um we, we're obviously more likely to pick up um very various respiratory issues asthma is obviously a main one but we're also um detecting many more cases of things like laryngeal obstruction which maybe people don't know is basically when the kind of the the upper airway constricts around your throat and that's when you get a, a wheeze when you when you breathe in during high intensity exercise. And we're also, I think, a, a big area of, of of greater awareness is in kind of breathing pattern disorders, which is is becoming much more accepted within within athletic populations. But even in 
the general population, um, there's much more acceptance and and uh, help available for people with kind of disordered breathing patterns away from sport as well. I, I remember when I was younger reading up about um, a really highly publicised case of Paul Scholes, a former Manchester United uh, midfielder, um, being diagnosed with asthma and thinking that was really unique and that being, um, you know, back sport pages, headline news. Um, do you find that nowadays, you're talking a little bit about it then, is there still a bit of a taboo if you're an athlete with a respiratory condition? Do some athletes see it as a sign of weakness? I think obviously it really depends on it depends on the athlete and it depends on the way that the way that the kind of the diagnosis has come about. Um, I think the skill is it, with with athletes that may be a bit cautious about maybe using an inhaler and maybe maybe Mike can can talk a little bit more about about this. But I think that the main things are that you present the evidence to the athlete and demonstrate that if it, it you know if it's an asthmatic issue, that the best way for them to protect their airway health is is to use inhalers that are you know they they kind of standard inhalers so we're talking kind of inhale corticosteroids which are the brown inhalers um or the purple inhalers um and then uh, alongside a kind of inhale salbutamol so all these um, inhaler therapies are, are kind of standard therapies that, that most asthmatic uh, patients will use um and they are permitted within within the, the anti-doping rules uh, and a lot of the research that we that we've we, we've done um demonstrates that therapeutic doses of of, of inhaler one, they improve the athlete's airway health, um, so there's less inflammation in their airways, and they improve their kind of asthma severity. But they don't provide what we call an ergogenic, an ergogenic effect. So they don't provide a, a performance, performing enhancing, performance enhancing effect. It's only when athletes take very high doses, and we're talking doses that aren't permitted by by, by the anti-doping rules, where potentially we might see uh, strength of power uh, improvements. But it's about educating the athlete around kind of why why they need to take the inhaler, uh, what the inhaler is for, how to use it, and make sure the inhaler technique's good. Um, and once we've given those reassurances, I'd say ninety nine percent of athletes are, are quite comfortable in taking the inhalers. I think or, there is also an issue in the press, and we've probably seen that um, blow up in the past when when we've had kind of high profile athletes call out for using inhalers and things. And I think that can sometimes be quite damaging because. Athletes then tend to go. Well, I don't want to use an inhaler because I don't want to be putting it. I don't want to be put under press scrutiny. When actually, that athlete needs that inhaler for 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 their airway health. And so we need to kind of we need to kind of make sure that athletes who are who have asthma and need to use inhalers don't feel kind of um, that they're that they're gaining an unfair advantage because it, it, as long as they're using their inhaler as as it's prescribed, that they're not. And and effectively, all they're doing is is protecting their airway health to to make sure they don't actually have a have a, uh, a an exacerbation during the sport that they love. Professor Loosemore, is that something that you've experienced with your work with um, with various um, athletes and various teams? And and I guess how do you kind of steer that conversation uh, away from uh, you know as we've spoken about some of those the, the pressures of performance and the um, and, and the taboos around it as uh, you know this is actually going to benefit you and um and if you follow that that training regime it, it will be for for your best and is within those kind of those, those uh limits put on by by doping regulators for example yeah I, I i don't i've never come across an athlete who has had a, a taboo about being diagnosed with a breathing disorder i mean this is a double win because one you're helping improve their health and in, in, in and, and keeping them healthy and able to breathe better and two, it improves their performance so there's there's no downside to this the only problem comes when um, you are looking at the wider regulations and the amount of salbutamol you can take and we know from the research that uh, dr dickinson has done that you don't increase your performance with the dose of salbutamol that is permitted by wada uh, the problem, of course, is if you go over that level. And so athletes being athletes, if they see something is working, will try to maximize that. So it is a huge education piece to make sure that they do not take their inhaler too frequently. And if they are taking it more frequently than they should, then is that because they've lost control of the asthma? And if that is the case, then how do we treat that in a different way rather than increasing the salbutamol inhaler?
Yeah. You mentioned the uh, WADA there, obviously the World Anti-Doping Agency. Um, Dr. Stang, we've, um, what about your experiences in Norway? Is, is what um, Professor Lusmore and Professor Dickinson have spoken about, is that something that you've seen um, with the athletes that you've worked with? Uh, yes, absolutely. It, it's the same in, in Norway. And we've actually had uh, some big cases regarding um, uh, doping and uh, and asthma therapy in some high profile athletes. And we got some reports then after that and the, the younger adolescents, kids, they they are hiding the use of, uh, of their medications and they don't want to use that in public because they are scared of the stigma. So I think it's really important that uh, everyone is united about uh, the, the importance to follow the doctor's instructions and the use the medication for their health and, and not to increase their performance. And do you feel, how do you feel work like the, this documentary and raising awareness as, as, uh, as, as you all have done, um, how, how do you think that is going to help in changing those um, th those current preconceptions and, and moving the conversation uh, onwards. Oh, I, I think it's it's very important, and and as a, a researcher, it's uh, it, one of the most important jobs is to uh, communicate the knowledge that you you uh, create, and 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 that the actually target groups and that the community can ten, can take use of it. And also has been mentioned here that several athletes who get diagnosed with asthma or another disorder, they can be totally unaware of it. The, the breathing is so subjective that uh, you, you, some, some people don't know that they have difficulties breathing, thinking that it's normal to, to have problems breathing when you exercise at such high levels as, as these athletes do. So we need, uh, as one of the, the athletes said in the film, we need the athletes also to be more aware and take more responsibility of their own respiratory health. And I think movies such as this can help raise these, the that awareness. Professor Dickinson, um, as, as um, Professor Lusmore mentioned earlier about the, um, the World Anti-Doping Agency, what's been the response from them and other bodies in relation to the research? Do you, do you find that Everyone's kind of, is quite aligned with um, with the research and the findings. No, certainly. Uh, I mean, we've we've worked quite closely with the UK Anti Doping Agency, um, and I know that that WADA have also used um, used used the research that we've produced to kind of modify um, modify their, their policies. So uh, some of the, some of our works influenced the decision to maybe just uh, kind of bring down the limit of how much shall be small individuals are allowed to use and things. So I think everyone is sort of seeing from, from the same sort of piece of paper um, and everyone's motivated. It, it's not just about trying to trying to limit limit medications. It's about what, doing what's right for, for the athlete, protecting their, their airway, their airway health, allowing uh, people with, with things like asthma to, to compete, but also not allowing them to kind of abuse, abuse the therapy as well. And I think we're at quite a nice, um, quite a nice uh, position in terms of where the policies are. There's still some probably some work to do around it, but, but I, I would say that the WADA and, and UK anti-doping are, are very responsive to, to, to the research that we, that we do produce. And it's been extraordinary in, in the film and um, hearing just today about those advances that have taken place over the last um, 20 or so um, years. Um, and also about how those collaborations have really uh, between different institutions have, have really helped with making those advances. Professor Lusmore, how important has that been for um, academia and medical practice to link up with athletes and, and have all of those different parties coming together for the for the benefit of athletes? This is one of the areas of research that has crossed over from elite athletes into the general population it's uh, i mean athletes tend to get more of these illnesses uh, exercise induced asthma and disordered breathing because they are if you like they're breathing more than the average person in the population because they're training hard and sometimes they're breathing hard in a difficult environment like in a swimming pool 
or in uh, in very cold, dry weather, like the maybe the cross country skiers do in Norway. And but this is an area that has crossed over into the, the general population and has allowed us to make these diagnoses uh, in non elite athletes and help them improve their health and their quality of life. So this crossover between uh, elite sport and uh, the general public is is quite big in this particular area. Uh, another social media question that we've had sent in. Um, in a co in a COVID affected world, many people will be suffering from long COVID, such as lung capacity. Um, can Professor Dickinson's methods help people affected by long COVID and restore people's lung capacity? Um, Professor Dickinson, I'll let you take that one. Yeah, well, <laughs> um, I mean, what I think probably what how I could respond to that is I think if people are affected by, by from from COVID in, in a lot of different ways, and and I think we're probably still finding out more and more around kind of how people are affected by them. What I can what I can say around kind of the, the methods we use in terms of breathing pattern retraining um, is I've worked with quite quite a few individuals um, who are experiencing breathlessness um, on a on a more on a more frequent basis on the after after having a COVID infection and and we've been able to help it reduce their reduce their symptoms improve their functional capacity in terms of what they can do um so they they, they do they do work i think we probably need to do some more more research to kind of um really get to the bottom of 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 of, of what's most effective in the therapy uh, of these individuals but I've say the, the breathing pattern training that I have done with 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 pa patients with who have had COVID has been has been fairly fairly effective, and I think probably what 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 happens is that some some individuals maybe it's not necessarily their lung capacity changes, but sometimes because of the COVID infection, people have kind of developed a, a sort of a breathing pattern disorder um because of the because of the covid and, and they haven't let it go kind of once they've kind of lost the infection so we kind of need to kind of re, 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 restore their 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 previous breathing pattern so that's that's probably a lot of the challenge that we need to do however i think the complexity of covid is you know is not fully known uh, and especially the, the kind of the, the, the call, call them long covid patients uh, experiencing breathlessness so it's a, it's a it's a difficult one to answer fully, but it, I say that the breathing pattern training that I've done with the COVID patients has has been effective. And Dr. Stang, obviously COVID's affected um, everyone in some way and everywhere around the world. Um, with those, we spoke a little bit on about earlier on about the challenges already faced by winter athletes, uh, specifically in Norway, um, with the environment and the conditions. Throw in COVID on top of that. What are the challenges that you faced with handling athletes um, in in a COVID world in in the environment that you're in? I don't think it's been too different from what's uh, been happening in other countries. Uh, of course, there's a big fear of g getting uh, the virus, uh, and, and also uh, the fear of the consequences, as John was talking a bit about. Uh, we are working a lot with um, when can they train again, uh, how should they start training and increase the training. Uh, and we all, of course, measure their lung function and uh, yeah, test them regularly, both, uh, both uh, during when they're healthy and after they have been in infected. Okay, and we've got, um, I just got a note here that we have got uh, people watching from all over the world. We've obviously got a very international panel. We've got a very international viewership as well. We've got people watching from Pakistan and Malaysia. So thank you very much, um, everyone, for tuning in. Um, we're coming to the sort of the finishing end of uh, the event. Um, so just to kind of uh, start looking at rounding things up. Um, Dr. Stang, um, what for you has been some of the uh, what have been some of the big success stories that you've been part of or you've witnessed um, using uh, these techniques? Oh, um, well, uh, when it comes to, to Dr. Dickinson's work, I think we, we change uh, some of the procedures that we do uh, on athletes. We have uh, trans start using the EVH test, which is a hyperventilation provocation uh, test to measure the bronchial hyperresponsiveness, so the sensitivity of the, the bronchi. Um, and I think that's been a, a great uh, uh, 
improvement for our both clinical testing and also in our research in athletes. And what about for you, Professor Lusman, what have been some of the, um, the real success stories um, over that, uh, that 20 year uh, relationship with uh, Professor Dickinson? Yeah, I think the, the most innovative thing that John has achieved was the recognition of disordered breathing as a, as a pathway for being short of breath and you know, really feeling quite ill when people were exercising hard. And for me, that's made the biggest change in my practice is recognizing uh, people having disordered breathing rather than having asthma. And I think that was that was a huge step forward that uh, that John initiated. And of course, as well, we've seen in that over the, the last couple of decades as well, that, um, that sport in the UK has really excelled on the world stage. It, they've um, just put in um, stellar performances at the, at the last number of Olympic Games, at the Commonwealth Games as well. Team England have been um, doing very well as well. Um, surely there must be some aspect of that that lends itself to to the um, this groundbreaking research and some of the other uh, pioneering advancements in, in science. Yeah, I'm sure the success of Team GB and Team England have been in part due to the sports science backup behind both those teams. And no little part of that is looking at respiratory function. We, we know that respiratory illness is, is one of the biggest things that stops athletes competing. And I think John's work has contributed hugely to reducing that. So, I mean, P uh, Professor Dickinson, it's, it must be really rewarding to see the take up in sports um, and, and especially in sports that you maybe follow by athletes you admire and in countries all around the world that this research is being it is informing all of that. Oh, yeah. I mean, it kind of, you know, the, the next best thing to actually be an elite athlete is actually supporting them. Um, and it's, it's great to, to kind of see them to kind of overcome their, their issues. I mean, I always say to the athletes that, you know, what, what, what we do in terms of the, the testing that we, we do in, and the identification of the various issues that, you know, it's still it's still that they've got to take it on board. They've got to to implement it the best they can. Um, but it really is, you know, it, it does cheer your day up when you, when you kind of see an individuals um, go on to it to kind of achieve, achieve great things, having probably, you know, I, I'd say it, it's not the, the only thing, but it, 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 you know, it's obviously been, been a contribution to the, uh, to their training. And then like, like um, uh, Dr. Evans said in the video, you know, what we're trying to do is help make athletes be as healthy as possible because the healthier the athlete is, the more often they can train, probably the better they can train. So that's, that's, that's been fantastic to kind of con 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 contribute to that in, in, in a kind of in various, in various different ways. And, um, as I say, you know, it's it, it, some, some of the some of the things I've been able and, and people have been able to kind of meet and, and and support doing this has been been a pleasure. We've spoken a lot about the the cream of the crop, the really elite athletes. What about the average member of the public? Um, how how can the this research inform uh, inform their breathing and how they go about their respiratory health? I think this is kind of the next the next thing, and and, and Professor Lucemore kind of touched on that a little bit as well about the kind of the, how we can transfer what we know in elite athletes and, and kind of use that in the wider population. Um, you know, measuring breathing patterns to help to kind of diagnose disordered breathing patterns is actually quite quite difficult and complex, and and actually finding a way to to um, kind of have a more of an objective assessment for the for the general population, I think it's going to be a big thing. Once we can do that, and once it becomes a recognised that I think we, we can just help people just enjoy being active, and I think one of the re possibly one of the main reasons that people choose to be inactive is because of experiencing breathless, breathlessness during kind of increased activity, and so therefore they choose not to do it. Um, and I think better awareness of of kind of breathing and and breathing pattern techniques is probably the next step uh, that we can go on to kind of support individuals just generally lead, lead a kind of a healthy, active lifestyle. And obviously then that's got much more um, kind of impact around their, their general kind of health and well-being, uh, and, and the whole country will kind of, kind of, kind of um, sort of benefit from that. So just leading on to next steps, um, you did that uh, for, for me there. What can we uh, next see from your work and research? I imagine that 
uh, now that the world's beginning to open up, that some of those international collaborations can uh, can kickstart again. What can we uh, what can we see next from uh, Professor Dickinson? Um, well, um, like you say, I think, I think in 2020 had a, a, had a really great uh, opportunity to, to, well, there was some really good opportunity to get back to start and obviously COVID has put them on hold, but we're actually kind of uh, going to reignite the, the um, collaboration that we've got with the, with the Nor Norwegian uh, team that, that, we, that we've mentioned before, looking at the, the, the impact or the influence of breathing pattern on the development of, of laryngeal obstruction. So we're going to be doing some, some work um, with, with the Nor Norwegian team there. Um, we're also, and I say, we're also trying to um, develop better, more more accessible methods of measuring breathing pattern um, that will will benefit athletes, but also benefit kind of NHS practitioners trying trying to help individuals overcome kind of reports of breathlessness uh, in the general population. There's plenty to look forward to going forward, but unfortunately, we're out of time today. Thank you very much to Professors Dickinson and Luce Moore and Dr. Stang for being part of today's live panel discussion. And a big thanks to you at home for watching and sending in all uh, your brilliant questions and from watching from all over the world as well. Um, keep up to date with the University of Kent's Research Excellence Team's website and social media for details on our upcoming films. There's plenty of exciting research research stories coming very soon. But for now, if you missed any of the film, we'll be playing it again for you in just a few moments time. But that's all from me. And thank you very much for watching. Goodbye. Athletes are in peak physical condition and their commitment to their craft is unparalleled. The field of sport is so competitive they would do anything to beat the best, win medals and etch their name in sporting history. For many though, there's something missing, stopping them from being at the height of their potential and that is that they don't know how to breathe. Now of course they can breathe but there are techniques, patterns and in some cases undiagnosed asthma that they have yet to learn about. This is one subject Professor John Dickinson is researching. He works in the field of sports science at the University of Kent and has helped to develop methods to enhance the performance for each of the athletes that he's worked with. Some of our work has demonstrated that over 20% of elite athletes have the condition and that actually increases up to almost 70% in certain populations like swimmers. Put that in comparison to the UK population, where 9% of the UK population have an asthmatic condition. And that sort of puts in context that a lot of athletes are more likely to experience respiratory problems than non-athletes. What we're hoping to do with this research is really change the way that athletes' respiratory health is managed. 20, 30 years ago, it was still wasn't really very well managed at all. And still, even now, athletes aren't really getting the best service of care possible, although, although we now know what the best service of care may look like which has still not um, got a, a gold standard test for. So we can start to use our research to help inform the next wave of improvements in respiratory care, not just in the UK, but around the world. He is trained with the very best, including the England football team, elite tennis players preparing for the US Open, rugby players, boxers, track athletes, cyclists, and even extreme sports people. He has shared what he knows to the English Institute of Sport and to doctors and physios of sporting stars. One of these up-and-coming athletes is Georgia Coates, member of the GB swimming team. His help has not only spurred her on towards the Olympics, but it's uncovered something she didn't even know was there. So it's quite intense. Um, I train ten times a week, normally two times a day, um, two and a half hour swim sessions and then also three gym sessions as well. I was almost confused about what was going on. I was struggling with breathing a lot in hard sets and even just low level training as well and I got on an inhaler which helped a little bit but there were still some difficulties that I found. Seeing the doctor and things like that they realised it might be dysfunctional breathing. My pattern was completely wrong but using the power breathe and the K5 from filming in the pool I've seen the difference but also a change in 
you know, I'm racing a lot better. It's not the limiting factor now, and I, it definitely was before. All the help and feedback that I've got from John Dickerson, I'll definitely use for the rest of my career. A crucial element to any sporting team is their physio. John has been funneling his knowledge onto these practitioners to further widen the amount of people who know how to deal with respiratory problems. After diagnosing one athlete and putting them on a breathing pattern retraining plan, their success story led to an Olympic medal. An athlete who had quite significant breathing dysfunction leading up to the Rio Olympic Games, um, they weren't able to train normally because of this um, and certainly weren't able to perform in competition to their full, full ability. Both important to have people on the ground informed, such as myself, who are working with them day to day, but they really valued the opinion of an expert such as John. And ultimately, the athlete did go on to successfully win an Olympic medal at the Games. So really, that's the, the proof is in the pudding where, in terms of performance. Having a respiratory problem can be distressing for athletes, so getting their diagnosis can calm their anxiety. Training more people to help the athlete work through a condition will help the sport exponentially and already has for Team GB swimmers. Often if somebody does have a problem with their breathing pattern, it would be the physios who would probably be expected to or left to help manage that. Whereas I hear a lot around the network of different sports that actually people aren't fully comfortable necessarily and it's not something that a lot of physios are trained in. A significant bulk of the basis of our strategy is based on what John has both taught us in terms of his interactions with individual athletes and through our athlete health screening. And alongside um, another physiotherapist in the EIS, have been developing some interactive educational uh, tools for basically which is going to be shared with EIS physiotherapists and athlete health practitioners across all sports. After testing large groups of athletes to see if they've developed exercise induced asthma, most elites have developed mild to moderate cases some even having severe cases and they didn't know it. However, some are more at risk. Compare swimming to, say, boxing. Swimmers are more susceptible to respiratory conditions and the prevalence of asthma is 70%. Boxers are exposed to high breathing rates, but this isn't necessarily for a long period of time and they have a ventilated room to train in. For swimmers, they spend what could be five hours a day, six days a week in the pool. This environment can also have a high chloramine concentration, which can cause an inflammatory process, which might cause an athlete to develop an asthma condition over a long period of time. Very different to recreational swimming, of course, and Dr. Guy Evans has been working with John on the world-class program for three years, hoping to improve athletes' respiratory health. My primary goal is to make sure that we have fit and healthy athletes, and if we have fit and healthy athletes, they, they will generally perform well. And approximately half of our swimmers would require inhaler therapy for asthma. Often a swimmer will come on to the world-class programme having seen their GP, maybe being told that they have asthma, they've tried a few inhalers and really never got to the bottom of their symptoms. Similarly, we have some who come on programme who've been told that they have asthma and actually when we do the testing we realise that it's not in fact asthma, it's one of the other two disorders. One of these is ILO, exercise-induced laryngeal obstruction. This requires a different treatment focusing on breathing patterns instead of medication. And before this, an athlete would have suffered with an undiagnosed respiratory condition, so spotting this potential misdiagnosis is imperative to their performance and well-being, as it's the number one reason why they would miss training. Now, when you think about injury, often in a pool environment, we can get our athletes doing other things in the water. If they've hurt their ankle, they can use a pool boy and they can swim with their upper body. If they've hurt their shoulder, they can do a kick session. If an athlete is ill or they've got a flare of asthma, they can't train. So actually they, they tend to miss bigger chunks through illness rather than injury. Minimising this is really important to us. We know when we look back through our own data that athletes who adhere to approximately 90% or more of their training in a year are likely to be the most successful athletes on our program. So it's clear that the research into these respiratory issues in athletes is making a difference and there's potential to go further. We spoke to the British swimming team before the global coronavirus pandemic, so for them and many others in sport, their dreams were put on hold. COVID-19 is a virus that affects your lungs and airways, so it has become more important than ever to continue testing. We've managed to find ways to support athletes remotely, 
So I've done a lot of video consultations with athletes. And what we found is that some athletes who did contract COVID have actually got symptoms that related to sort of long COVID and are still struggling to recover. We're working with them to try and understand how that's affecting their respiratory system. But we're also interested about the way they change their breathing patterns as well. It's fair to say that the sporting world was turned upside down throughout the coronavirus pandemic, with many sporting events in 2020 being cancelled, namely the Tokyo Olympics, the London Marathon and big tennis tournaments like Wimbledon. The Lawn Tennis Association houses elite players who luckily were allowed to continue training early in the first lockdown. One LTA athlete we caught up with was Harriet Dart. Throughout the pandemic, the tennis star used all the advice John gave her and she looked forward to the big things that were coming up next. We did a range of different exercises and I continue to practice these each day. I'm continuously looking out for my respiratory health and this has helped me a lot with my tennis career and in general life. When my breathing is better, my shoulder positioning is in, in a lot better place and I can focus more on my game. I have hopes for good chances in the Grand Slams and with the help of all these exercises for my breathing, I really think that I can eliminate a lot of my injuries in the upper limb. It doesn't seem like there's much room for improvement for elite athletes, but actually, in many cases, using the way you breathe to your advantage can be the difference between winning or losing. A lot of these athletes have had a lifetime of breathing a certain way, but also have already reached pretty impressive goals and therefore trying to retrain is a is, is quite a challenge so with quite a few other athletes that have been given exercises through John we try and obviously incorporate them in their day-to-day -day rehabilitation but also we try and incorporate them when they're actually performing on the elite platform and so some of our athletes have utilized the exercises for kind of helping with performance helping physiologically but also psychologically John's even collaborated with researchers in Norway who have changed their practices based on data produced here at the University of Kent. John's research has also informed the treatment of asthma in competition, having worked with the anti-doping agency to change policy. Something like your typical blue inhaler, if used out of line with the rules above therapeutic levels, it can give some an advantage. The anti-doping research has enabled John to educate athletes about the appropriate use of asthma therapy to protect lung health within the rules. We've demonstrated that if athletes are dehydrated and they take doses within the water limit, their actual level of the drug in the urine can go above the decision thresholds that water use. So effectively what we're doing is we're ensuring that athletes are able to have as good a respiratory health as possible and also compete on a level playing field with their non-asthmatic counterparts. There's still plenty to do to improve the quality of care in respiratory health in athletes, something that's often overlooked. But with this research, athletes will have the potential to reach the peak of their sport without limits all across the world.